tardes, buenas noches. Tenemos a 14 personas en, el, en la sesión. Sean todos ustedes muy bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Salvador Venegas, soy profesor del Departamento de Lenguas Modernas. Eh, enseño inglés, eh, español y ahora este semestre un poco de chino. Estoy muy entusias entusiasmado con la Feria Internacional. Y bueno, pues ahora me toca presentar a esta ponente que está en este momento en China, son las 9 de la mañana en China. Su nombre es Tina Liao, bueno, es su nombre en inglés. Uh, Tina, ni, ni la chongwen ming si se llama. Ese es su nombre chino. Entonces, antes de comenzar la charla de hoy, eh, les voy a leer un, un pequeño disclaimer, solamente pues para que estén enterados que esta sesión va a ser grabada. Al ingresar a la presente conferencia de la décima feria internacional, los participantes entienden y aceptan que sus datos personales e imagen podrán ser divulgados por la Universidad de Monterrey para los fines aquí descritos. La sesión será grabada y almacenada para, para conformar un repositorio que servirá para futura consulta y referencia de la Universidad de Monterrey y también podrá ser difundida por la misma para fines administrativos y otros relacionados con la promoción y capacitación por parte de la universidad. El acceso al material y contenido del presente evento no implica una licencia gratuita para su uso, por lo que deberán respetarse en todo momento los derechos de autor. La información compartida no podrá ser transmitida, grabada ni divulgada en ninguna forma a ningún tercero. Las opiniones expresadas en esta sesión son responsabilidad de cada participante. Se solicita realizar este intercambio de ideas y opiniones con tolerancia y respeto. Sean ustedes nuevamente bienvenidos. Por favor, este, intervengan con preguntas, eh, comentarios, etcétera, cuando lo consideren necesario. Eh, so, voy a hablar ahora en inglés para presentar a mi amiga, Tina Liao. So now I'm going to switch to English and have a little presentation of Tina Liao. Um, her talk is about Chinese collectivism in cultural studies, one of the most essential divergences between China and Western countries is probably people's different attitudes towards individualism and collectivism. China has controlled the COVID-19 epidemic situation in a short period of time, which could not have been achieved without the practice of collectivism by Chinese people. Chinese collectivism was formed on the basis of collective orientation, which not only includes the relationship, the individuals and the family, but also between the individuals and the country, the nation, the society and other individuals. The lecture will firstly explain what Chinese collectivism is and then present how it works in Chinese society with examples from this people's war against COVID-19 in China. Tina Liao is an applied linguist from Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. That's where I met her uh, some years ago when I went as a delegate to teach English in summer camp. And she was very helpful and uh, a really good friend, um, beautiful, uh, person, as you can see, on the outside and on the inside as well. <laughs> and so she is the project director of the College of Continuing Education from 2008 to 2018 at the same university. She, she has ample experience teaching general and business English. She has written several articles and is now a lecturer at the university. So you're on your own, lady. Um, go on, break a leg. Thank you, Salvador. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's definitely something that I didn't expect to be going so smoothly. I thought like, okay, this is gonna be something international. So, well, I'm really glad to be here and really appreciate this chance to talk with people from on the other side of the planet. Mm -hmm. All right, so here, I guess I'm gonna, uh, is it like I can share my screen, right? Yes. Okay. All right, um, so can you see it? Yes, excellent. Okay, cool. All 
Okay, so, uh, well, as I just said, I'm really happy to have this chance to talk to people from the other side of the planet and definitely it's a valuable chance for me to share. And I'm actually just sharing here as a kind of average person in China and also uh, as a person who has witnessed some really great historical events, I would say. And this is some something related to culture. So I try to involve a little bit about my culture studies. And also I know that this is actually the Internet of International Fair. Yeah, uh, from Salvador's University. And I'm really uh, kind of feeling lucky to actually have this chance to become part of this whole international fair. Well, uh, just now Salvador has already introduced me. So I, I was like just to say a few words about my personal experience related to my work and all the things I'm interested in, things I'm doing. Uh, for now, I'm a teacher in the university and also Salvador mentioned I have been in charge to do different projects. So the projects are usually related to some training programs, including the middle school students, like in summer camps. That's when I met, you know, Salvador for the program in the summer. And also I did some corporate training, you know, since my major when I was studying for my master's was related to business English, uh, which is like a branch of the applied linguistics in my university. So in this way, I got a lot of chances to actually talk to different groups of people. And also today, later when I'm, I hope I would be able to share the recording from one of the programs I was doing. And actually that was an interview, that's an interview, you know, for one of these topics here related to today's topic. And also uh, I am a big fan of cross-culture studies and anything related to culture and language. So um, I teach a lot of different courses related to to these different aspects, including business English and also like translation or interpretation uh, between Chinese English, many of course, and in China mainly. And also some more English courses. And there is one thing I was mentioning earlier is about business English. And actually the specific uh, term for that is called English for a specific purpose. So uh, maybe there are different kinds of companies which uh, need some services about English training, maybe related to like real estate English, which is a program I'm doing lately, and also some more different kinds. And also, uh, I'm a huge fan of traveling. I've been to 20 countries, over 40 cities around, you know, the whole world, outside China mainly. So anytime when I'm traveling, I just, um, I just definitely love to have some chances to exchange ideas and cultural aspects with people from different countries and backgrounds. So that's why, as I said today, it's a kind of valuable chance so because, uh, because of the pandemic, we couldn't really travel easily. That's why we can do this internet, you know, conference or this kind of talk, which is a very, very helpful way, actually. And besides all that, I'm definitely um, open to a lot of different kinds of discussion, ideas related to anything about culture or even anything I'm interested in, like traveling. So uh, that's all related to my personal information and I'm really um, grateful to have this chance and I guess it's time for us to begin. Okay, so if you have any questions, oh, by the way, this, I just forgot to share the logo of my university. Uh, if you had any chance to come to visit China, yeah, you are welcome to come to my university. I will be your guide and also will be your, maybe a introducer to the country or culture here and well, even if you wanted to learn Chinese, Salvador will be there introducing all that and also about Chinese culture. And he knows my university really well too. All right, and let's see, uh, today my talk will be mainly of a few different parts. So I would like to give you a general picture. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, involve a little bit about culture theories. Uh, this is gonna be from one of the Dutch scholar called Hofstede's, you know, his theory about cultural dimensions. So one of the dimensions, which is, I think the most important one I wanna to cover today is about individualism and collectivism. And also I will mention another three related dimensions related to also collectivism, I would say related to that. So that's why I wanna mention that. So this is just the theory part, but I will also involve some aspects or specific examples in Chinese societies to show you a little better idea about the situation in China. 
and then uh, I will specifically focus on uh, the topic related to the the pandemic COVID nineteen fight in China, and I will say that this is uh, quite let's say in some way it could be a little bit helpful. Like people might have all these confusions or questions about how we actually manage to do all this, and I hope that this lesson will be give giving you a kind of general picture, maybe not very specified, but definitely from the, I would say the primary da data, because I do see it and witness every day here. And then uh, at the end of it, the conclusion will be mainly just uh, what I was going to say at the beginning related to this whole collectivism, but also I'm open to different kinds of questions if you have any. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to um, introduce this theory briefly. And uh, since this is not really like a kind of very, I wouldn't say it's a very academic or very abstract, you know, lecture is mainly related to our cultural elements. So here, I think it's good, like we have some general referred to theories, right? And that's why I chose uh, this Geert Hofstede's, you know, cultural dimension. I think he has actually shown a very clear picture about how, you know, the cultural dimensions or the degrees like different cultures can show in terms of different aspects. So his theory uh, is actually like a foundation for cross-cultural communications. And he demonstrates how society culture has an impact on its members and how it relates to people's behavior. And this picture, as you can see here, is actually a kind of general overview related to those six different dimensions. And there's power distance index, and then the individualism versus the collectivism, and also the other four, masculinity and also, you know, femininity. Of course, that one is also one of the most popular cultural studies around the world right now and also certainty avoidance index. Uncertainty avoidance index is actually related to, in some way, I would say, to collectivism and individualism, this dimension. So I will also mention this one, besides this one, and then the next one I mentioned also in my talk today. And the next one is the long-term versus short-term. Uh, I would say that one has also been very uh, typically, you know, shown in our Chinese culture. So I will also mention this one too, as well as the last one, indulgence versus restraint. Well, uh, this is also something quite close related to, I would say, individualism versus collectivism. So these four different dimensions will be mentioned in my talk today. Uh, the other two, if you're interested, I will give you also the link and also related, you know, reference you can take a look at or know more about. Uh, so uh, let's come to our first part, individualism and collectivism. I'm sure that you have heard of this term already, like these different two aspects, right? And it's always one of the major you know, fields people would like to talk about in culture studies. So uh, this dimension in Hofstede's culture dimension theory, it explores the extent, like the degree to which individuals in a society are integrated into a specific group. So it's related to the relations between in the, an individual and the group. And also the ties that people have within their community and the perceived dependence and obligation on groups. So it's something related to how we uh, look at ourselves as an individual or a member of a group. And also like how much you involve yourself, how dependent you find yourself on this whole group. So something like that, of course, we have like two different kinds of situation. Uh, like in this picture, like it's something about me as an individual or it's like from the perspective of the group. Well, the first, let's take a look at individualism. It's called like a moral stance and also like a political philosophy or even, you know, like an ideology or social outlook that emphasize the moral value or worth of an individual. And for this kind of uh, concepts about, you know, individualism, it usually emphasizes or values a lot one's personal goals and desires, like 
also your self-reliance and independence, like how you depend on yourself to achieve some, you know, personal goals. And that's actually very important for this individualism, of course. And also uh, it focuses on the precedence of individual interest over a social group. So it means like if you want to look at it, compare which one is more important, and an individualist will probably consider an individual's personal interest is more important than a social group's interest. Even the group is, a, is one that an individual belongs to. And also uh, for this kind of uh, ideas, they kind of oppose external interference upon one's interest by society. Well, I would say that this kind of um, idea or philosophy will be more kind of typical in the Western world in general, comparatively speaking, you know, with the, compared with the East side, like the Chinese society or even Korean and Japanese. So people care more about your personal, for example, like freedom or independence or space. However, uh, as for collectivism, it's a value that puts emphasis on cohesiveness or unity among individuals and also uh, prioritization of the group over any individual person like oneself. So it's definitely has like the other extreme, not really like that extreme, but this is a very different picture from the previous one, individualism, right? So here for collectivism, individuals or groups that subscribe to a collectivist worldview tend to find common values and goals. So the group of people will usually have like similar uh, directions or interests or goals they want to achieve, not as an individual person, but for the whole group. So it demonstrates greater orientation towards in-group than toward out-group. So here I would like to explain a little bit about in-group, out-group. Let's say, uh, I don't really know about specifically related to the situation in Mexico, but in China, let's say, if I am actually from like a, a local small city, let's say I meet, meet a new friend and then I say, okay, I come from Jiangxi province, which is a province in the south part of China. And then there's another new friend who I don't really know at all. All right. And he would say, oh, really? I'm from there too. So it's like even just the first meeting we have together, but because we actually from the same province or the same area, we kind of immediately share a kind of, immediately share a kind of like in-group, you know, concept. It's like, okay, we share a lot in common, we share more in common, and immediately we can become like familiar friends. I mean, not always like that, but in general situation is just have this in-group and out-group concepts in China. And we might immediately develop some more kind of closer or better relations with someone if we notice like, okay, he's actually from my group or something, right? So that's also a very typical situation for the collectivist, you know, uh, society. And also uh, it gives priority to a group or a society rather than to individual interest, of course. Uh, for this kind of uh, collectivism, we, definitely will look at the whole picture, like the whole group, instead of focusing on an individual person's needs or desires. So everyone needs to do their best for the well-being of the society, of the group. All right, so this is like a very typical explanation, of course, related to collectivism. And also I would say that it has a very typical picture in Chinese society too. I would like to share a few photos with you the photo is actually from the Chinese society, very commonly seen. Like this is a party picture, you know, in China. Uh, I actually searched the picture related to a company's, we call it annual gala. Uh, it's like at the end of the year, people celebrate it to, yeah, to sometimes you just celebrate the new years or the ending of the year and also the fruit of the whole year. And then they would just hold a party. And the party will involve a huge dinner together, a dinner party, and also some performance. And it's actually a very typical example of all the Chinese parties. It's not really like in Western country that you might like have a few people, right? Maybe one or two, no, one, okay, just two or three people, small groups together. But in China, we always sit around a big table and share the food and also share with the whole group, talking with the whole group. 
So the parties in China are just like that. We don't just do small groups. We do huge groups. And sometimes Tina, it's a, possible. Sorry, I have a question, Tina. Uh-huh. Um, I noticed in, in the times that I've been in China, I noticed that, for example, in restaurants, yeah. it's, very, it's very common that people sit in round tables, like right. whole families and whole groups of friends. And, and it's also very common to have these little rooms that you can, you know, that you can have a private kind yeah. of meal. Mm -hmm. And this is, all, this is almost in, in 50% or 60% of restaurants. Is this considered an example of collectivism also? For this, you mean the small rooms in a restaurant? That yeah, you're just doing? having, you know, just having a meal with, you know, your coworkers, your family, and, and right. these small rooms, which here in Western society, we, we usually don't have those rooms that you can rent and have a karaoke session or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I would say it's not like a typical example, but it's like a situation. You got a room and in this room, you can have dinner or meals with your own person, your own friends, right? Like also like a whole family. Uh, I don't know if you noticed all these rooms also have the big tables, right? Or maybe like two or three tables together. So mm -hmm. it's not just like for two people. There may be just very few rooms like that for only like two or three people. And usually the whole room will be for this for this group. As you know, like for this uh, picture I show you here, it could be like the whole company, right? They are holding yeah. this big party and they yeah. know each other and they wanted to share all this fun and food together as a whole group because they know each other. But mm -hmm. if you go to restaurants, of course, there are strangers around you, right? You don't know everybody in the restaurant. Everybody just come there, go there as a customers. So in that situation, we might want it a personal room to talk more effectively, you know, without yeah. interference or disturbance from strangers they don't know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's more like a comparative term, I would say. You know, it's not okay. like we always be friends with everybody, even if we yeah. have yeah. nothing to do with us. Yeah. So yeah. if they know each other, as we said, like in group, out group, right? So mm -hmm. if they consider like, okay, this is my own personal, our group, and you belong to our group. And then we would like to, definitely would love to share more and everything with you, including the fun and also the ideas and also talk. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, yeah, anytime you have any questions, you're welcome to ask. All right, this picture, uh, sorry, the quality may not be that good. It's a picture of the tour groups. You probably have seen a lot of Chinese tourists, right? Uh, maybe in the past, since the past few years. So you might see always like a huge coach, like a bus carrying a bunch of Chinese tourists and they just love to travel in groups. You probably have noticed that. And they definitely would like to go with a tour agency. And of course the tour agency arrange everything for them and they don't need to bother doing all that reservation and all that, you know, tickets booking. But um, yeah, in China, even inside China, people, would like to take the group, you know, traveling, this kind of style more than individual traveling because they think uh, not just because of the convenience, but also they would like to make friends with a group of people, especially if they know each other, they would like to travel in groups. So compared with other, you know, uh, countries, maybe I would say Chinese people love to more, definitely love to travel more with the groups instead of individually or independently. Okay, so uh, there are a lot of more examples like that about collectivism. Well, later uh, when I involve the examples related to the pandemic, I would like to share more related to that. But before we come to that part, I also would like to introduce a few other dimensions, which I think also kind of very typical situation in China too. It's about, it's about uncertainty avoidance index. Uh, so it's got a UAI uh, index. So they put it in a way like high and low to different kinds. About the uncertainty avoidance is about the tolerance level of society for uncertainty or vagueness. It's like how people deal with something, you know, they, they're not sure about or something they're not clear about. And for those low, um, the, the index, right, is for the lo those low UAI uh, societies, they tend to accept different kinds of opinions and thoughts 
you know, ideas or that can be diversified in this kind of society. And also comparatively, they might have some sort of lax regulations and rules. Let's say lax is more like, it's not really strictly implemented or enforced. You can have certain flexibility there. So yeah, it, it tends to be not so strict. I mean, the rules and the regulations. So in this kind of society, it's tend to be more free with more freedom, personal freedom, for example. And also it's more open and people more open to different ideas and different th ways of thinking and thoughts. However, for those high UAI societies, they tend to have quite strict and clear laws, guidelines and codes of behavior. And also people tend to believe in truth. They may not want it to just discuss a lot of you know, abstract or unpredictable things. They might want to just like a look at the facts and that's the thing we need to follow and that's the rule we need to also like observe. So in this kind of society, people tend to make life as predictable as possible. Well, I guess you probably have noticed the Chinese society will be more like the high or low. Yeah, definitely the high one. Well, in China, we even have, I just, I would like to give you this example. Okay, as you can see, there is a picture of like a bow, right? And this bow, we call it Jin Fan Wan or Tie Fan Wan. I don't know if you know the Chinese, okay? Uh, Tie Fan Wan, iron bow. And Jin is like gold, you know, gold bow. Well, it's not really a bow, okay, it has this cultural concept there. Let's say uh, iron bow here in Chinese society usually means a job, you know, a job which gives you securities or guarantees that you're not going to lose your job and you'll always, you'll always be secured, you know, for your personal income and also, you know, the, the job won't be gone suddenly or you get fired or something. So this kind of job is usually the kind of positions in the government departments. I don't know if you know what I mean. It's like if you work for the government or similar units, for example, uh, maybe some different kinds of, okay, yeah, including the state-owned companies, you know, the, the, the company which are owned by the, by the government, you know, this is called state-owned, and they tend to offer this kind of positions. Um, which people never need to worry about, like one day they get fired or something like that. So if you can get a job like that, working for the government or like a state-owned company or some similar units like that, then you are believed to have got a iron bow and you can feed yourself without worries and you don't need to worry that one day you will lose your job. Okay, so that's the, the Chinese uh, way of saying about these kind of jobs, which gives you guarantees and also the predictable you know, security or safety in future. And this is the UAI. And next one is about the long-term versus short-term orientation. Uh, this term is related to the connection of the past with the current or future challenges. Okay, so here I would say, yeah, definitely quite clearly, there are two different kinds. One is long-term, the other one is short-term. As for the long-term societies, I mean, the long-term oriented societies, they focus on the future more than, you know, like a short-term things or, or time period. And also they value long-term growth a lot. And they definitely consider persistence as a value, ve very valuable quality and also being modest and also the virtues, obligations, so in some way they were considered if you got good at saving things and this is something also very valuable quality. However, for the short term oriented societies, uh, it focuses more on the present rather than the future. So they tend to uh, favor quick and fast results and also short term success. Well, I would say, yeah, the huge differences between these two different terms will be will be kind of quite obvious between the East country and the Western country in general, I would say. So 
the Chinese society is definitely the long-term oriented society. And let's say, let's just put in a way like a kind of contrast. Okay, we Chinese people consider, for example, American people to be someone who always so so oriented or towards the short-term interest. That's how we look at them. They always want something really fast and immediate. And they are really efficient at work. Yes, we, we totally agree. But they focus more on the short-term interest more than the long-term growth. But the Chinese society probably definitely, yeah, tends to value the long-term growth. So maybe at this short-term period of time, within this short period of time, we don't really see any kind of obvious fruits or results or any good, you know, uh, results about something or success. But it doesn't really bother Chinese people that much for this short-term loss or something like that. They focus more on the future. Like, what can we do? What can we get in future? So here I would like to also share, like, this character. Uh, quick question to Salvador. You definitely know this Chinese character, right? This scene? Um, no, I don't know. I know the, the bottom part, which is... Sin. Oh, yeah, yeah. The bottom part is the, is the heart, right? You know, this Chinese mm. character also has an interesting combination. And above that scene, you know, heart, you can see it's another character. Is that Li? Knife. As in... Knife. As in... Dao. Oh, Dao. Okay, okay. Yeah, we, without the dots in, you know, this part. The dots, mm. right? It's, mm. a, it's like a, a knife. So the knife above the heart, it seems like a knife is like kind of, you know, cutting or hurting your heart here. It's actually a word called ren. I don't know if, if you can, oh, it's hard to actually recognize a tra one character. It always works with the context. But this word, uh, you might see this word becoming like a kind of calligraphy picture in some people's homes. Like they put a huge Chinese character like that you know, as a kind of calligraphy artwork. So it means tolerance. So what, what it's is, about- what is, this, what is this character in China, in Chinese? Ren, tolerance. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's like so. tolerate something. Yeah, so um, I wanna use this character to, to share this kind of long-term, you know, oriented society here. Uh, we consider like if you are tolerant with something of course not so really nice all right something pretty horrible maybe even even like you have you are suffering from a lot of negative things in your life but if you can manage to tolerate it and get through it and always like hold on yourself and persist in fighting and take all that you know very negative things and then one day in future, you will succeed. And this kind of negative experience or suffering will someday become a gain. You know, it's similar like a, a fall in the pit, a gain in your wit, you know, that English saying, okay? It's similar, a little bit like that. However, uh, we consider like the, the process can be like long, you know, it's not just a, a kind of short-term tolerance, it can be long-term and it's actually valuable and also it's respected like if you are able to tolerate with all these suffering for a long time and people believe that with all that suffering one day in the future you will succeed you will find the light you know and that's the also the long-term concepts idea among chinese people okay next one and also the last one i mentioned uh is the indulgence versus restraint well, according to the words, you probably can tell, like, okay, these two are also kind of extreme situations, right? It's about the tendency of society to fulfill one's personal desires. For the indulgence-oriented societies, uh, it's usually about free fulfillment of one's emotions and drives. Like, you have to satisfy your personal needs, right? So that's why I mentioned, I mean, this, as you can see earlier when we talk about individualism, is kind of related to this kind of uh, tendency, right? This kind of trend. So that's why I said, you know, we probably need to mention this one too. And it's about, in this kind of society, people will tend to enjoy fun, enjoy life, and also advocates freedom of speech. Yeah. So 
I would say in the Western country in general, probably this kind of um, industrial oriented Saudi will be more typical than that in the East side. In the East side, yeah, including the Chinese and Saudi will tend to be more like this kind of restraint, right? Oriented society. It usually suppresses, you know, personal gratification or satisfaction or personal desires. And there are always strict social rules and laws, regulations of that to control people's behavior or or any like personal desires. But it's not like we totally have no desire, of course, like in general, okay, tend to. And also in this kind of society, there tend to be rigid and controlled behavior and codes of behavior, right? As we mentioned earlier about the collectivism too. Well, uh, for this kind, this part of difference, I would say it's, it's a little interesting to look at the whole difference between um, the Chinese people's way of, let's say, entertainment or something. We have a saying also related to the character earlier, the tolerance character. And we, we would like to say, we wanted to, uh, okay, let's, let me put it in Chinese first. We call it xian ku hou tian. Xian is like first, ku. It's actually called a bitterness, you know, bitter, like something really bitter, not really so sweet, bitter. Hou tian is like later, tian is sweet. So it's like uh, first bitter, later sweet. Okay, so that's the Chinese idiom, the traditional one, cheng yu, okay? And this concept is, I think is something like this. We, we don't really always enjoy something sweet. You know, we, we always trying to control our longing for a sweet or something like that. And we wanted to follow the rules and work hard, like working hard first to even a, to a degree like we need to suffer from a lot of things, you know, like the super hard work, which is not really that delightful, right? So we were okay with that and we should work hard at first and then later uh, we can enjoy the fruits and that's something sweet. So- Okay, uh, Tina, so yeah. yeah, that's very interesting, the Chang Yu. Um, mm -hmm. So first, first bitter, then sweet. Yes. Uh, so wh why do you think, th so the Chinese <clears throat> culture is oriented toward this last uh, dimension, right? Restraint. Yeah, restraint. Uh, wh why do you think that is? Um, well, the reasons behind all these culture difference will be quite complicated. I will probably tell you like this is related to the deep rooted uh, concepts or you know, which just can be summarized into, as we mentioned earlier, collectivism, right? And this whole collectivist society tend to, you know, focus more about the interest or the achievements of the goals of the group instead of your personal desires. Mm -hmm. So in some way, you can say that we, we don't really value personal desires that important compared mm -hmm. with the group. Well, let's say the father in China in a family, right? He may not always consider, okay, I need to have fun. I need to go grab a beer after work because I've been working so hard. He's not going to do that. And in China, a typical phenomenon, especially in those less developed areas, they will like leave their family, their hometown and go into a big city. And we call it migrant workers. And they... they Originally, they were the, maybe the farmer or peasants in the rural area, and they can work in the, in the field, but in order to get a better life for their family, they would just leave the hometown and go into the big cities mm -hmm. and work in those, for example, construction sites as a migrant worker. So they work hard and send the money back to the family to support their kids. Well, actually, the family will only have like the grandparents and the kids, so the grandparents right. will take care of the kids. So, so, Tina, for example, I noticed that when I was there also, I noticed that there is a general feeling, I don't know how to, how to explain it, but I noticed that students work very hard, sometimes very long journeys, starting at 7 or 8 in the morning until yeah. 5 or 6 in the afternoon. Do you think this working hard is part of this dimension of culture? Yeah, I would say because they think that if you want to get something, it's not going to come easily. 
you have to work hard for it. You have to like suffer from a lot of boredom, maybe you know, from the from the study, and including like those people, the the parents, you know, who work in a very maybe a very stressful job, you know, they 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 can go through all that just in order to one day maybe his family can live a better life. Also, as you mentioned, like the students who work super hard at school, they work hard for years, maybe right, even for a long time like until they're 18 or 20, 22 years old when they graduate from the university, they think that, okay, it's fine to work super hard right now as long as I can have a have better future, more present future with a better job and better living conditions, all that. So this is a kind of also quite traditional belief, like we, we just need to work hard for something and the something can be sweet, but before that happens, we need to put in our efforts, which can be quite bitter, not so fun, you know. So that's the, I think, yeah, definitely can be reflected in a lot of different aspects in Chinese societies, whether it's at work or about the study too. Okay, so this uh, are the four dimensions I would like to share based on the theory. Uh, if you are interested, I will. Also, this is the the site I used. Uh, I have a few books, but. The books will be a little complicated to, to share here, but you can definitely find this theory quite well and you can uh, take a look at it and know more about it, especially there are a few different other dimensions there. All right, so continue. I would like to move to the next part of my talk today. Well, I would like to share these two pictures and this uh, kind of yeah, very typical contrast between the two situations or two different societies. Well, um, I want to involve this topic because we are still going through it. And really, as as a person who talked to a lot of friends from different countries, including the USA, I feel quite sad to see the situation of the pandemic, you know, COVID-19. And it's kind of getting super serious. And I really hope that this can end very soon. I know it's not easy to end very soon, but, and sometimes I would say, uh, if, if my, my talk today can actually, you know, give you a tiny bit of idea about what people do here, and then maybe in some way, you know, a little bit helpful for other countries to overcome this, this really bad, you know, virus situation. Well, you can see the two pictures here. I would say that the first picture is in from the USA, right? And they say my freedom, personal freedom does not end where your fear begins. Well, I look at the picture. I don't think I'm qualified to criticize this kind of thing. I totally understand it. You know, they focus on their personal freedom, as we mentioned earlier, as an individualist society, you care about your personal freedom, yes. There's nothing wrong about that. And I also agree with that. Well, this is something we don't really see much in China, I guess, you know, definitely we don't see that, especially during this pandemic. Well, in China, you might see the picture on the right side. Well, if they say, okay, um, not just say, they say even like anytime, especially at the very beginning when the, when the outbreak is still happening in China, right, early this year, we, people have no questioning about all these rules, about social distancing, wearing masks, all that. And you will see people totally follow the rules. And it's like, there's no questioning about that at all. And we don't really think that at this moment, our personal freedom is that important. Well, believe me, I had some struggles too. Like, you know, in back in my hometown, we also kind of like this whole, uh, we, we call it compound or xiao chi is like a kind of small neighborhoods, we, we just close the doors and people cannot really enter or exit easily. And yeah, we, in some way, lose the freedom. Not completely though, we can still go out to buy stuff. But uh, we don't really think that's a, something we, we cannot really take or anything. So it's a very big difference between those two different societies, I would say. And here I would also like to, um, yeah, share with you about this report related to the Chinese society you know, in controlling this COVID-19 epidemic. It's actually from a German media. Uh, I forgot to put the name here. I forgot exactly the name. It was just uh, a German media. It made a summary about how China managed to control this epidemic, right, in China, inside China, while the other countries are right now suffering. 
and they concluded that there are four things that China has done. Okay, it's not from me, by the way, it's from that report. All right. It says uh, it's because of the immediate response, large test, large scale test, right? And also contact tra tracking, tracing, and also the quarantine measures are quite strict. So that's the first thing um, they listed. And the second one is the limits of cross border entry. Well, if you want to enter China now, you might have to go through a lot of different procedures, actually, not so easy. But it's not like completely uh, closed. The borders are still open, but just not really that open anymore. Not so easy to enter anymore. I guess it's the situation for a lot of countries. But comparatively, I would say China might have stricter, you know, this kind of entry allowance. And also the tests and quarantine measures are always quite uh, strictly enforced at the airport, at the border. And we have specially uh, quarantined hotels for those people who enter China and also all other related you know, procedures. Also, uh, the third one mentions the efficient large test, large scale test system. It specified that one, which is slightly different from the first one. The first one is more related to the immediate response about the time response. And also uh, the third one is about the large scale test system. Well, this example will be um, the city, I don't know if you heard it from the news, the city is called Qingdao in China and the whole city uh, which involves uh, millions of people, of course, 11 million tests of the whole city in Qingdao was finished in only a few days. Well, uh, the time limit is also important here. If you like wait for a long time, then the, the effect of the testing, the result of the testing won't be, you know, enough significance anymore because people might get reinfected again, right? If the time is too long. So the time is quite short and, and we do have all these related facilities and all the equipments available to do all these large scale tests. And it happens all the time you know, in China, as long as there's any kind of uh, new cases or because not because of the, the local um, transmission or anything, it's more related to some uh, imported cases or some imported even products, you know, they found some virus at the frozen food, imported frozen food. Yeah, and some workers there got infected and then, well, if they show the symptom later and then a lot of people will be tested and even the whole society, the whole city. Right, that's the third one. And the fourth one, it says, it's about people's trust in the government and voluntary cooperation. Well, uh, I'm actually a little bit surprised like uh, Western media will actually report it in that way. Well, which is the truth. It's more true even among the Chinese people here. Yeah, it is definitely a fact that people trust the government you know we cooperate really well like let's say some new cases have been found right and then the government sent a notice to people on the news saying that okay any, anyone can come to the spot you know there will be like a spot of the city which offers the free test like this in the picture and people will just go there lining up to find to get the test which is free by the way free okay you don't need to pay anything and then, uh, yeah, you will see all that happening and people will just do it, you know. And also, uh, if you want some group of people, not all the society, though, even like the whole city, as you know, the lockdown, yeah, people will also cooperate to do all that. So it's just easier to tell people what to do here in China, I would say in general. Okay, so here now, speaking of these uh, measures, according to the... German report, right, from a German media. And I would like to also speak from the perspective of Chinese people. Uh, so back to the topic today, I wanted to use this COVID-19 fight as the example to explain about the Chinese culture, especially collectivism. Uh, well, as Savada mentioned, introduced earlier, you probably have read from all the news. Well, we do manage, you know, to stabilize the COVID-19 epidemic situation here in comparatively quite short period of time compared with a lot of countries as you know it could not have been achieved without everyone's involvement you know everyone's this kind of collectivism concept and I would say every group in China has a role to play I would say it's like groups of people can not just like every inner person individual person yes we do individual person do it but we more like kind of look at in a group. 
All right, so here I would like to mention a few different kinds of groups or examples of those people, what they have done here. And this is a picture, uh, a comic picture from, you know, some websites. It's, it's about, you know, the I don't know if you know the Chinese character here. Uh, is, you can see there are three, uh, probably Salvador know this word, right? Ren, you know, person. Yeah, so that's three people yeah. together. Uh -huh. Three people together, yeah, means uh, masses, you know, broad mm -hmm. masses, like, a, yeah, a lot of people, right? So a lot of people uh, have this intention, zhi is, is like the, the target, the purpose, and we will make the target happen. We will all together achieve the purpose. Okay, Zhong Zhishen, that's the first three characters means. And this, the second three characters is to fight. Yi Qing is the, Yi is, is like a pandemic or epidemic, Yi Qing situation, just fight the, the virus situation. That's the meaning. Okay, and also you can see that here there are a lot of different you know, roles, right? You can see this is a doctor, maybe this is a nurse, right, doctor, and this is some people working, like maybe a soldier or something, and this is the policeman or security guards. Okay, so uh, with this, I would like to share with you different roles, okay, in our society who have involved themselves or put effort into the fight. Uh, first of all, I have to... Yeah, it's definitely a must to mention the central government's guidance, the whole, let's say, like the central command. You know, they have the ability to mobilize different sources nationwide. And you can see those photos. Uh, I don't know if you have read any news in China. Okay, let's see. I don't know if you can. You can see my mouse, right? This picture? Yes. yes. Okay. This picture is a, is a rewarding ceremony a national, very big national event uh, in the middle of this year, okay? And this is the president in China, as you can see, and four of those people, they're the ones who has won the, who has won the honorable title. Yeah, the heroes, we call them the heroes. And Yin Xiong, in this picture, you can see those two characters, Yin Xiong. And they're the national heroes, we call them. And yeah, as you can see, they're doctors, yeah, experts. And this woman, she's now the person uh, in the leading position in developing the vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine. And this guy on the right side, his picture is here. He's like one of the top, top honor in this fight. And his name is Zhong Nanshan. Well, if you don't really know about him, you probably know uh, Dr. Vouch in the US, right? And we call them, uh, he's like the Dr. Vouch in the US. And, but uh, yeah, we, we call them the Chinese hero. Like he's 84 years old this year, but you can see he looks quite young. And he's a, a doctor expert too in the, uh, yeah, those, um, how do you call it? Contagious disease control, that kind of, you know, uh, special academic fields. Yeah, he has definitely contributed a lot, you know, with his own personal academic and professional knowledge in China, including the, the, the coronavirus in 2008. I don't know if you heard of it yet. Yeah, there was another one, right? And he's also the person in 2008. Uh, no, sorry, it's not 2008. It's, it's earlier, right? It's the, the previous coronavirus in China which also has infected a lot of people, a lot of people died, but that one was definitely nothing compared with this one. And at that time, he was the person who came to the public speaking the truth, like warning the public saying, he, we call it, you know, like, like the, the whistleblower, right? And he was the whistleblower. And he warned people like, this is gonna be contagious among humans and we should do something and what they have done so far in the hospital and the government is not enough and all that. He has come out and speaking the truth and also, yeah, directly pointing out the problems in the fight. And then after that, he has won definitely full respect among people, not just say the government people, but average people. We all just look up to him as the hero. And he also was a person who called to visit the central government uh, around 20th of January this year. 
like at that moment, he came to the public talking to the media saying that this new coronavirus is or has already been proved will be uh, to prove to be contagious among human beings. And he's a person telling the public that. And then with that message and then all related uh, departments and also the hospital saw that started to, you know, do something about this, this um, epidemic. And he was the person who was appointed by the central government as the, the top uh, leader of this whole um, group, this team, to fight this coronavirus epidemic. And he has been given full respect to and power to, to tell people or direct all different groups of, um, especially medical workers, to do their jobs. So I would say that um, even the government is there behind, of course, but it does respect professionalism and science. And that's why these people have given us the right instructions to follow. Instead of just say it's about politics, it's not just about politics, it's more about people's life and safety. So all different kinds of things, not just say the medical workers, but also a lot of other, you know, things the central government has done. And here I would like to give you a few more examples, like the lockdown of Wuhan. And also that was a huge, very, very, uh, yeah, I would say shocking decision to a lot of people, including the Chinese people. So when they locked down this whole city with been, you know, uh, I forgot like 10 million of people, right? More than that even, I guess. It's like a huge decision. A lot of people were really panicked because never has that happened in history. But with the lockdown, there are a lot of other things going on. It's not just say, you know, limit people's traveling, that's all, no. They also built this hospital. I don't know if you have heard of this from the news. This hospital was specially made, you know, built for the for taking care of the the patients, right? And I don't know if you can imagine, like they basically established the whole hospital within a week, a few days actually. So in a few days, like the whole hospital can be established with all the resources we have got, you know, including the construction workers, as you can see that, and this is all life show you know on the internet and people can just turn on the live show and seeing how this whole hospital is going on here in, in at that moment of the year and it's not just the government though yes the government have to mobilize all the resources build the hospital well at the same time there are like the logistics like transportation and also the soldiers involved and even some private enterprises involved too they donate donates their products like this one is the tv tcl is a tv company and they donate their tv and also like huawei you probably heard of it they donated the 5g facilities and all other like uh the equipments the medical equipments all that were kind of like donated by the different companies you know with just all the the kind of directions or guidance but more also related to people's contribution personal uh, donations and then we kind of made the miracle happen established the whole hospital and definitely with that hospital built a lot of patients had a chance to take the the medical care and that's how the people's lives are saved all right so that's from the government yeah definitely there were a lot of things they have done and i i cannot really list everything now here i would like to mention the medical workers of course they're definitely the group we need to respect and yeah, people totally respect those medical workers. And we even kind of touched by a lot of stories reported during that time. So they were devoted to the fighting of the pandemic on the front line. And some even sacrificed, have sacrificed their lives. Uh, well, probably you have heard from some news since I know that some Western media has reported. Also the whistleblower, the guy who has got infected, the guy who has worked in the hospital has got infected by the virus and later he lost his life. And he was not really like, um, I don't know how Western media was reporting about him saying that he's the whistleblower and he got infected and then he died and he sort of like, uh, uh, we, we don't like him or something, but no, not really we also respect him and also the government has made him also the whistleblower the hero title too and the point is at the very beginning not many people know what's going on it's a new virus right and he was the person who has got infected and 
he was also quite positive during the the medication you know the treatment period I, I saw the news about him too but unfortunately he did die because of the the, the virus yes directly and they did sacrifice their lives uh, quite a number of them and their stories are definitely something that we we appreciate and also we respect and it also touched into a lot of people they have demonstrated strength of the collectivist spirit for sure here i would like to share a picture like this with you this one uh it's from like guangxi another province in china we know hubei right hubei is where the wuhan was so they sent the fourth group to fight to help fight the virus well at that time almost like during the chinese new year period a lot of provinces have sent medical groups or teams to help with Wuhan. The, med the, the medical workers in Wuhan was definitely were not enough to take care of all of the patients at that time. So a lot of other provinces sent their, the medical groups there to help them, including the new built hospital, right? They, all the workers there are actually from different parts of the country. And at that time, we also have a, lot, a, a huge shortage of all these equipments, you know, PP, uh, personal protective equipments and all these, even cleaning the masks, all that. Well, with the people, right, and also the groups going there, they carried with them the medical equipments and resources, all that. So they went there and, and managed to help fight the, the virus. And there are a lot of different groups, not just a one group, you know, not just say from one or two provinces, a lot of different groups, a lot of different hospitals even sent them. Well, these people, when they come back, they are respected as heroes too. And they did actually face a lot of risks because at that time, nobody know much, knew about much about the virus, right? They could, you know, get their personal life uh, even, you know, lost in certain situation because the virus at the time was totally unknown and, and people are not really clear about what will be happening. And here, the next part, I would like to mention something about the present situation in China with those doctors, nurses, and more people who work in the front lines. Besides the doctors and nurses, uh, some test workers about the large scale test work, right? And also the airport stuff. And this one, the picture on the right side here or the, at the airport. And also some quarantine hotel workers here now in China also work directly with the people who, you know, come back from those uh, places who might have got the virus. So all these people are working now in, in these places, different fields. Well, like this picture, these two pictures, uh, this foreigner is kind of stay, spending two weeks in a hotel, appointed quarantine hotel in China, in different cities in China and they will give them the test at the beginning. And actually in total, I heard there are quite a few different tests. And also uh, they will be given food or any kind of services they need. There will be people working there who give that, satisfy all that. And this picture on the right side is actually from a friend of mine. He just came back to China and he spent two weeks there in the hotel. And on, that, on the day he arrived, it was his birthday and then the people at the hotel even give him a birthday cake. So I would say that this all involves a lot of people's effort there. And these people might have more risks to be exposed to the virus than the average people in, in Chinese society. Yeah, so their work is definitely helpful. Next part, I would like to mention something more related to our average people. I guess you probably don't know much about this, how do you call it? Um, maybe it's related to the political system, actually. In China, we have this community agencies. I don't know if you've heard of it. We call it local community agencies, street office, you know, even more kind of smaller units called a street office. And also we call it compound. Well, it basically it's like a kind of real estate property you know real estate property it's like a few blocks or buildings together we kind of formed a, a compound with all the fences and all the you know nice environment even and this kind of like compound or property will be like a group a small group and there will be management office which is usually offered by the property company actually 
like a real estate company. And these different kind of units will actually implement the policies from the superior departments, like the governments from the from the city or from the province. And then maybe he got that from the central government, all that. So in these pictures, you can see uh, this is like the neighborhood, the gate there. And he lives inside, of course, and there will be a gate. And also like this one, this they, we call them security guards. Okay, They're not really working in a police station or anything. They just work as the guards to to maintain the safety in the neighborhood. So they will always give you the test of temperature nowadays. It's very common like that. So these are in the cities. Now, two more pictures I'd like to share with you about the countryside, the rural area. Well, in the, this picture, picture on the left, this road is a path leading to a small village. And during the outbreak, all these small villages might have like people stand by the entrance of the village and they will be working at the security guards and make sure people from the outside don't go in and people from the inside don't go out and all that. And if you want to go out, you have to like go through all kinds of different formalities, all that. So they are like the people who work in the village government. Okay, maybe you have another word about that's we call it the government in the village, the office there. So there will be the people working to make sure these policies are carried out. And this one on the right side, uh, also this is like small village and they were working there. And there is the, the flag, right? I want to show you this flag, Dangyuan. You know, Chinese government is the communist party, right? And there are a lot of communists in different parts of the city, right? In the lower level who basically don't really have any power anyway. So there is a lot of people who with the communist title or part of the party. There is a very interesting thing. I don't know if you've heard of it. Probably no. Okay. Because it's, it's something quite from our local uh, stories, let's say. Uh, during that time, especially serious period of the time, the outbreak, including the medical workers, including these people who work in the small towns, okay? They are at greater risks of being exposed to the virus, right? Because they are working there, contacting different kinds of people from different places. So there is a question is, who will be sent to work, say, at the entrance of the road in the village, right? Or who work there to test those people or give them a temperature or something who might come in back from Wuhan? You know, it's not like the, the city is totally locked. Before the city was locked, there were a lot of people coming out of there too. So there was a very interesting policy. Uh, the people who has the communist titles or the positions, not just position, even just a common part of the member, you know, as a communist party member, you will be the people who work there. So it's not like a kind of personal choice. It's more like a kind of must. Okay, since you have... Uh, committed yourself to the party and now it's time for you to serve the people okay there's even like a very actual example from my from my relatives you know at that time we were during the lockdown period uh we did have quite a few cases in our small county we call it county like a small city and my aunt my father's younger sister she she was a she's a doctor and her husband works in the government uh, in the county so there were the people who are called to work at the front line. We call it front line. For example, my aunt was called to, to work at the entrance of the freeway to test people's temperature, you know, um, and record everything, all that. And also, uh, I forgot exactly what my, my uncle was doing, but he was also doing something similar like that because they are working for the government and the doctors too, by the way, they're like state owned units. So. So they're the ones who will be working there. And you have no idea, like at that moment, definitely this group of people have done a lot, you know, all this detailed small work, which may not seem like a huge thing, but, but they have been the people who's actually implementing the policy. So this is the situation at the moment. Um, a lot of this group, this huge group of people, they have done all this detailed daily work and they have in some way definitely guaranteed the safety of average people. And next one, I would like to also mention uh, average people's daily, you know, stuff. 
for example, uh, we didn't use a lot of internet to order food, order something, or buy something. And here on the left side, some pictures about those we call it delivery people. So this is a kind of very uh, popular position right now in China, a kind of job, you know. A lot of people work in these delivery companies, like those yellow suit guys, we call them. And they're the ones who deliver your food within 30 minutes. Like you use an app online, yeah, on your phone to order something and then they will deliver it within 30 seconds. Okay, so 30 minutes, sorry. And usually they will charge you like about less than a dollar for the delivery fee. You know, that's what the situation is like in China. I would say that um, how can we actually manage to live a life, a quarantine life in a kind of acceptable way? We cannot really live without those delivery people. They have really done a lot to facilitate people's daily issues and including the shopping, including, you know, all these necessities they need for their daily life. And also uh, the online lesson, like what we're doing now is something also quite common, but now it's getting less because we are back to normal and we go to school. But in the past, the kids, we spent like a whole semester studying at home and also teaching at home. And this picture I would like to share is about also average people's life is like. Like this picture is, is a picture about those quarantine life in a family and people find their own entertainment way. And this is now uh, like the schools like and all the kids wearing masks and there is like a kind of rule, a strict rule you have to follow. And this picture is about uh, let's say this woman probably is going through a quarantine because of visiting some places, maybe. If they cannot really buy stuff, there are community service people that will offer them the service of helping them to buy stuff, you know, like sending them the supplies and foods, all that. So the, the whole community have all these different groups of people who's there offering the necessary help. And last picture here, I use this picture to kind of share with you a little bit related to how how those people in Wuhan was like during the beginning of this, at the beginning of this outbreak. And as I mentioned earlier, I did have a kind of um, lesson, right, related to this topic about culture studies and also this pandemic a week ago. And that was a group training actually, it's from a unit, a company, I guess, and one of the people, the students I was talking to was actually from Wuhan. And she shared with us some stories about her, her personal experience during the beginning, uh, the, the beginning parts of the outbreak here. I would like to share this recording with you, if I can. <laughs> Let me see how can I do it. Just a second, let me play this recording first. Uh, at, uh, in Okay, so I would like to share this recording and please let me know if you can hear it, okay? Let me just play it. 8 o'clock p.m. Um, yeah, there's uh, no problem. We can hear. You can hear, right? Okay, cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I just want to mention a little bit about her. It was just a short, you know, uh, recording because I was like talking to her before the recording and then I suddenly we call, okay, why not let me record her and and then she's okay with that so i just started recording it but this is like about one minute recording here and something about her feelings uh her, her from her observation and a few things i need to mention when she was mentioning about the or oh, maybe let me just play it first and let's let you listen first uh, at uh, eight, eight o'clock p.m um, a lot of videos short videos were posted in the french circle they just a uh, uh, they um they just uh, shout out and crying like uh, cheer up China cheer up Wuhan and then they started to sing the national anthem. I feel very even I'm very bad, but I can feel the brightness of the Wuhan people and their sacrifice to stop the. 
virus. I think um, Hubei province is a very unfortunate <laughs> this year, but I believe um, under the leadership of the nation, uh, we will conquer the COVID-19 and uh, will make uh, us make all the nations united. And uh, that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, it's a short recording, as I mentioned. So uh, she was say, talking about what she saw from, we, we call it uh, friends moment, oh no, friend circles in, in a Chinese media called a WeChat. Like we, we share a lot of our daily stuff with the pictures of videos or, or just words, you know, on, on the social media. With friends like what, what is happening or they're just like a daily diary it's a little bit related like facebook you know and, and we just record our daily stuff and she was saying that she saw all that from the the wechat moments we call it moments you know like the friends friends circles and i think that she was really kind of um you know how they call it when i was talking to her when she at the beginning you might hear a little bit voice um unclear voice there she was about kind of like crying when she was saying about that. So she was really the person who was experienced that period of the moment. And she was mentioning a few words like getting united and all that. And she heard people saying that we, we should we should cheer up, we should stay positive, you know, that's that's what you meant what she meant. And I think uh, from this talk, you probably can imagine during that period of time, people just have all these very complicated thoughts like fear mainly, and also disappointments about, you know, well, why this is happening again. Like it's not the first time we go through the virus and again, we have to face this. And it's a new one, even so much uncertainty. You know, as we mentioned about the uncertainty, people were just really kind of panicked. And, but the, the part we probably can notice from the recording is not just her, but a lot of people at the moment were kind of thinking like, okay, we should you unite our our strength together to do this, you know, to fight this virus. And as you heard, like she even mentioned that people were seeing the national anthem, you know, voluntarily and just trying to do something, you know, it's in their own way to to whether to cheer people up or to give people more courage or something like that. So um, just a bit of sharing about my interview with one of my students who, who's from Wuhan, who has witnessed what has happened at the very beginning. I think that this picture back to, uh, let's see, back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so you can see my PowerPoint again, right? Yes. All right, good. And as you can see about this picture, she, I don't know, you know who this is anyway, but at that moment, yes, there are a lot of people who are not just say, okay, we are fighting. They also have, when, they have also gone through a lot of really, you know, bad moments in their life. They lost their families and friends and, and they, they were struggling too, like so much worries about this unknown virus and also about the, like some families couldn't really find a spot in the hospital because there were too many patients. And and they, they just like, just hang there and trying every way to save their lives. And this was also quite kind of hard period, not just say for them, but for the whole country. And we faced a lot of uncertainties at that time and we worried and then we panicked too. And some mistakes happen, yeah. And in the end, it is, it's all kind of come to, more and more clearer picture and we, we find the ways including you know the funny points i want to share here too about what happened in the very beginning like we don't really have enough masks right because nobody knew that that would be the situation masks will become the most popular we call it nian huo, you know it's like we, we buy a lot of stuff for the chinese spring chinese spring festival but in the end we never know that the mask became the most popular one so at that time, uh, interesting example, like there were this, uh, this small city, maybe not that small though, like actually one of the major cities in Kunming, uh, in, in Guang. 
yeah, Guangxi. No, no, sorry, Yunnan, in Yunnan. And it was um, not far from, it was somewhere in the west, southwest of China. And there was this city, uh, the government in that city kind of stopped a truck carrying the masks sent into Wuhan. Because at that time, every place is every city were trying to get the masks, right? Because that was the thing which can protect you. And the government of the city stopped the truck and get the masks out of, from that, yeah, from the truck. And it was reported because at that time, nobody was knowing like, okay, uh, what, what we should do. And something they just try every way to get the masks and the supplies all that. And the government did make that decision. And then the media reported it. And not in a nice way, you know, we don't always just say everything is perfect in China in the media. We do criticize stuff too. And we, the media reported in China and the government also reported that. I mean, not reported that, have also revealed that was the truth. And what happened is the central government immediately sent this, this decision, like the, the people in the government in that city was, was fired. You know, they just taken off their titles and they lost their job. Actually, at, the, at that period of the time, there were many similar cases like that, including those people who work in the government in Wuhan. They were fired and also they were punished and a lot of things like that. And I guess like foreign media will never know all this going on. Wow. So anyway, yeah, uh, it, it happens. Katina, we're, we're running out of time. Um, oh, so. sorry. It's yeah. just like too much sharing. That's okay. Okay, <laughs> okay so... Okay. Yeah, that's the end of it now. Uh, the last part, just want to mention. Yeah, the leading uh, by the government is important for sure, but the whole nation, yeah, is definitely there helping fighting this, this virus. And the people from all walks have done their parts and their job to do this and to fight this in unity. Well, with the full practice of, I would say, it's still about the patriotism or we call it collectivism, more likely, I would like to call it collectivism. And then we kind of managed to get back to normal. And we, at least for this pandemic, we kind of, you know, managed to, to fight it and to control it. Thank okay. you so much. I'm sorry for interrupting. <laughs> um, it, it's all very interesting. And I'm sure, I'm sure you only scratched the surface. Um, but this yeah, was a good just some pictures, to the, the surface to the, only. To the system, this system of belief. Uh, somebody has a question from the chat. I don't know if you can see the question. Jessica Rodriguez, she asked, as someone that has interest yeah, in cross-cultural studies, what is a clear example that you can give us about the conflict that comes when you study different cultures, ideas, or philosophy? Give us about the conflicts, right? It's like a kind of um, different ideas uh, from a different culture is that we mean like culture conflicts like mm -hmm. culture shocks mm -hmm. okay uh i would say okay just let me just check this again okay uh let's say i have traveled to some places and also i have i have talked to a lot of foreigners in China too. And there are a lot of, we call it culture shock, right? And also the, yeah, we, even conflicts like we, we might have when we deal with people from a different background or different culture backgrounds. Let's say uh, there will be kind of, okay, just an example about the culture conflicts, right? Okay, let's say the, China, the, the foreigners in China might probably consider uh, the way that we do things, like we we don't really criticize the government or something like that, right? And and they were just say, okay, we are kind of brainwashed or something. Maybe they, they were considering that way. But as I just mentioned earlier, if you look at those culture dimensions, I wouldn't say it's just about brainwash or anything, okay? It's more like we don't really have so much different ideas or so much so active in in a very different way of thinking we tend to think like within a group like we think as a kind of in-group idea not like a, so much focus on the individual different ideas so maybe i would say that's a kind of uh, conflicts when it comes to about 
speech freedom or something, you know, among a lot of a lot of people or people who don't know much about Chinese society. It, it's, it's some way we cannot say we have all the freedom of speech or anything, but maybe in the end, if, even if you give him the, the rights to, to criticize or anything, they don't really have anything to criticize. They probably don't really have all that, you know, personal different, very divergent views. Okay, so I was just to think of this kind of example. I don't know if that answered the questions. Yeah, um, but in general, the Chinese are very tolerant uh, about yeah, the foreigners, the foreigners' cultures, aren't they? Aren't they? Well, let's say um, Chinese will look at the foreign culture in a way that they they might have something different from ours, but it's not like we just hate it. Okay, there is also very interesting culture difference. I I just thought of like the attitude towards new things, and. I cannot say exactly what the reason or the cause is, but you might see that in China, people actually tend to accept new and fresh things more easily. You know, we, we are more open to, to like, a, like, for example, new technology or devices. And even you look, at, if you come to China, you might see all the different kinds of weird shape of buildings. Like, like we, we do have this tendency, we would call it collectivism, we have this in-group or, or out-group concepts. But when it comes to some new or different things, actually people are pretty tolerant. And also they tend to open, open their mind and accept it more easily. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've also read something about like a, a culture study, like some foreigner noticed that too. They're more open and more easily accept some new and fresh things in China. And I think we can go on and on talking all night. Yeah, uh, there's, a couple a more, there's a couple more questions, interesting questions. One by okay. Luis Muñueco. Uh, you see the questions? Yeah, I see the second one. I've always known that Japanese culture is considered to be very collectivist culture to a point where they consider company they work for as part of their own family. Is there a similar feeling in Chinese work culture? Yeah, I would say it tend to be like that, you know. If we work in, in a company or in a group, we probably can develop more complex and different relations with the coworkers, okay? Let's just put it in this way. Let's say uh, quite a number of my good friends, actually my workers. So we don't just say, okay, we are here just to work, you know, to make money or something. And we, or we also like a group as friends even some of them can be like as close as like, you know, close friends or even family. You know, they have this, we call it sense of belonging. You know, they belong to the group and they, they belong to, to the company or the units they are working for with the same target, with the same goal. Yeah, it is a similar situation in, that chi in China too. Okay, and lastly, one last question, which is very interesting um, by an anonymous person here. Can you read it? Yeah. What's the situation like in China right now? Is it all back to normal already? I think there, I think it would be very interesting to compare now more individualist culture to in the fight against COVID and comparing the collective culture, not just China. Yeah, I I would say right. That's that's one of the reasons I picked uh, collectivism because I'm more representing China here, and in Chinese society tend to tend to be more collectivist. So. If you wanted to see what is exactly going on in the West country in general, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a fully qualified, I, even though I do talk to friends from other cultures, from other countries. It seems to me, okay, you can still hear me, right? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. It seems to me that right now in the West country, because this individualism is definitely more obvious and stronger than over collectivism, so people care more about their personal freedom, personal rights, right? And they may not consider like what they do have certain effects on, on other people, other people as a group, as a society. So that's why in general, you might see that Chinese people are much more cooperative because they think for others, like as a group, like they don't want to be the person who destroy the whole group. Let's say they come back from another country in China. They will not go out there saying, that, oh, you cannot lock me down and I want my personal freedom. Uh, they were just say, okay, I don't want to spread the virus. I don't want to hurt my family. I don't want to hurt my friends because of the virus or even unintentionally, you know? It's in general, it's just more like at this moment for this pandemic, we in some way need the collectivism 
more badly than individualism, I might say in this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I totally understand. Well, Tina, we want to thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. This is a little diploma uh, certificate of participation in this fair. Oh, yeah, I see so now. I, I've emailed it to you already. So oh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. We're so grateful. Um, wonderful thank introduction you. to collectivism. And um, so that's going to be it for today. Um, so to the people who um, were in the audience, you can use the link uh, that was shared before to express your um, opinion, appraisal of the, of the talk. So I'm going to say that in Spanish. Para los que participaron por ahí, había una línea, una, una liga para expresar la evaluación de esta plática. Les agradecemos mucho su participación. And I think we're going to, uh, we're going to call it an event right now. We're going to call it quits. So thank you, Tina. Have a nice day. Thank you. And wish everyone the best. And... Yeah, hope you can get back to normal like China very soon too. Yeah, we hope so too. Thank you. Okay, Tai Tian. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>